if we put like snacks and juice boxes in this studio mm-hmm. and maybe took out the cameras to try to do a live feed could, yeah could, could like the we cameras. just like lock your kids in this room every day and then you just know where they are yeah i think but then like maybe have some time to yourself and you get in trouble for that i don't know maybe maybe we should get licensed as a day or something yeah yeah. All right. Well, that's that's storyboard media's next daycare. spinoff is is storyboard daycare. Ooh. Yeah. All right. Oh wait, that that I hear is the play-in music. Oh, there it uh, is. Which means we should stop talking about spinning off into a daycare and welcome our audience to the Video Reformation Podcast. Welcome. I'm Ben. I'm Justin. We're the co-founders of Storyboard Media and your guides to the on the journey to practicing effective video for business. We're like the Dr. Fauci to your escape from the coronavirus. Before we jump into today's topic, which is uh, part two of our hiring series, mm-hmm. uh, we'll be talking about hiring an editor today. A uh, little housekeeping to take care of, like in the last few episodes. Um, again, to our viewers and listeners, we are interested in what you are interested in. Uh, again, we can keep coming up with podcast ideas and, and topics, um, but if it's not something you want to hear, then what's really the point? So we encourage you to let us know what you want to hear. Additionally, uh, who might you want to hear as a guest on the podcast? We have a wonderful guest today. Um, where, What other podcasts do you listen to do you think we'd be good as a guest on? Love to hear all that. So um, yeah, just love to hear your feedback and uh, make sure that we can tailor content specifically to you. Um, Ooh, Lake Lure's calling. Oh, I'm getting, an, uh, let me just decline that. I imagine we'll be getting a call from Harris Teeter at some point, too, because I have a <laughs> one o'clock pickup and haven't heard a confirmation from them. Is that anyway, a sponsor for the week? Maybe. Um, speaking of sponsor, I understand that we have a new sponsor this a week. A new sponsor, yeah. Uh, who, who's that? Uh, it, it's called uh, Steep. Steep While You Sleep. Uh, helps you watch it all without opening an eye. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about that yeah. later in the uh, yeah. later in the episode when you hear the full spot. So, welcome to our new sponsor, Steep. All right. I think it's time to jump into the topic of the day, which is hiring an editor. Uh, I'd like to start by welcoming our guest, Mars Kennedy. Hey, hey guys. <laughs> What's uh, up, Mars? Hello, Mars. Um, now, you've worked with us on several projects before, so we know you, but I don't know that our audience does. Do you want to start by telling them a little bit about yourself, who you are? Yep. So my name is Mars, and I am located in Raleigh, North Carolina, and have been a freelance video editor full-time for about three years now. And how did you get into editing in the first place? So I studied media production in college um, with a focus in film, and then Kind of right when I graduated, I went to a networking event and met my boss, my first boss, and um, started working at Red Hat as a video editor, and that's kind of how it all started. That's a pretty legit, like, first, first job. job. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, get to yeah, be an quite. <laughs> editor for, a gr- like, a really great company. Yeah, And they've it was got a awesome. great team over there, too. I know. There's, oh, have you yeah. been in their new studio in that space yet? It's amazing. I've I've worked there several times. It's okay. a gorgeous, gorgeous space. Yeah, yeah. I would love to visit. Love to get you to the storyboard studios sometime. Yeah, yeah it's um, homey. Homey, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's kind of like a cottage. A yes. Bit more than a real studio. <laughs> or perhaps an interrogation room. <laughs> yes, it does. Oh. It does have that feeling. Uh, Come yeah. on over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's go with the Red Hat angle. Were you uh, freelance with them or were you full time with them when you first started? So when I first started, I was uh, like a contract employee um, Mm -hmm. and I but I was there full time, like 40 hours a week. And that went on for about two years, I guess. And then they hired me as a full time uh, video editor. And then I was there for a total of five years. Okay. So one of the things that I really want to make sure we talk about today, and I guess this makes it the perfect time, is kind of the difference between freelance editing and editing like full time for an employer. Uh, Right. So when you've worked with us before, you've been a freelancer, you work out of your home. We have our uh, revisions process, communication process like that. But how, how does that how is that different from working full time at a company, same company all the time? I imagine there are a lot of ways that it's different. Yeah, so I'd say like when I was at Red Hat, you or when you're at like a company full time, you know, you know the company, you know the brand, you know the products, you know the lingo. You 
have already done all of the research to understand, like for Red Hat example, for example, it was, you know, all their technology offerings. So it was easier for me to tell that story because I was so familiar with the products. And then kind of the revision process is um, pretty like set in place where, you know, the team really works together, um, which is really cool. So it's nice being part of the greater team in the company. And then when you're freelance, you're obviously telling the story of, you know, many different companies, many different types of products. So it just requires like a little bit more research before you get started. So if a client was to reach out to me from like a light bulb company or something, I would make sure that I did the research to understand their needs, um, like from a brand perspective, from a product perspective, from a communications perspective, before I, you know, feel comfortable to tell the story. That's an interesting point. Do you feel like you have more creative flexibility with one arrangement over the other? Does the familiarity with the brand give you more flexibility or does that almost put you more in a, this is the kind of content we produce and do the same kind of stuff over and over again, which, which one has more lateral flexibility? I would say definitely working for, uh, working for the company full time because you're part of the team, you know, everybody personally, um, you feel, I guess, because you're close with them, you feel more comfortable to like push back more or like, you know, Mm -hmm. get their feedback, share your feedback. Um, you know, you know, the art director, you know, the creative director, you're able to go, you know, talk to them personally and be like, I don't know about this direction. I feel like maybe we should be adding in this, or I don't see this detail as being important. So it's like, you are really integrated in that team. So it's much Mm -hmm. easier to, collaborate. And also, I mean, when you're working for a company full time, it's like they hired you for a reason. They trust you as an expert. So they want to hear what you have to say. And sometimes when you're freelancing, it's not so much that way. Like they hired you to, you know, cut the video and give them what they want. And sometimes that's just the way it is. And that's okay too. So you talked about getting to know the team as leads perfectly into another thing I wanted to discuss. Who, who was typically involved in those teams? You mentioned an art director and I think a creative director. How many other people were typically involved in, in those projects? So it was, let's see, when I was there, I mean, there was like several like shooters, a couple editors, and then there's usually there's animation in most of the videos. So an animator was involved. Um, and then, you know, you have like your video team lead and then like the top of the umbrella team lead of that branch. So, I mean, it's a lot, a lot of people, but it kind of, I mean, I think what's great about Red Hat is they don't believe like the best idea comes from one person. It comes from like the whole group. So, I mean, they really, you know, live that down through like every bit of the organization. So um, it's like a lot of people are involved. So you get the best, you know, the best um, end product. I bet working full time, you get to be more involved throughout the entirety of the project as opposed to getting handed footage and say, all right, cut this. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I bet that sometimes that's nice just to be like, all right, I'm going to go cut this and and then I get paid and you guys are happy. Uh, But then some other work where you, you know, it's probably really rewarding to be a part of something where you were involved in pre-production. Yeah. I haven't even, I've, I've never been, a full-time vi- oh, no that's not true that's my first <laughs> that was barely liar uh, <laughs> but there, were, there was not a team orient no you were a full-time like one-man band yeah in the closet don't yeah. talk to us yeah you're no longer in sales Justin you were the entire team <laughs> yeah yeah so um, how early would you come in on these projects typically if it was something that you were gonna edit did you come in from beginning or was it after a treatment or concept was set or, you know, how early were you involved? Um, so when I was there, the team was a lot smaller. So we were kind of all involved from the very beginning, usually, um, Mm -hmm. which was really nice. So they would kind of designate like, okay, Mars, you're going to edit this piece, you know, so-and-so is going to shoot it. Like, is there anything that you think would be valuable to get as a B-roll shot or, you know, a, video portrait, you know, so it's kind of, it was nice being involved from the beginning because I would know the story. I know what they were trying to say. So I can think about like, oh, okay, well, they're going to be, you know, in Vancouver, like, it would be great if we could get a shot of this and that, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. So I think being involved from the beginning as an editor is always 
well, maybe, maybe not always, but usually it's pretty great because then you can kind of, um, help them out with what you think they should get also for shots. Well, and that, and that reminds me too, that, you know, even as a freelancer with us, um, I think it was the last thing we worked on together, but, uh, we covered, uh, our client's event in San Francisco, but we were able to talk to you beforehand and get a sense of what kind of, you know, San Francisco B-roll you wanted, what kind of, you know, questions you wanted to ask in the interviews, those kinds of things uh, of the attendees, et cetera. And that gave us, because of course we were, we were basically just traveling producers for that one. So we had um, a local San Francisco videographer working for us, actually doing all of that shooting and interviews. So it was nice to know from you, the editor, who was going to edit it, what stuff you wanted to have. And then he got that, and then he kind of did his own thing on top of that to give you some options. So I think it's certainly, even even in a freelancer scenario, the earlier you can bring in the editor, the better. And I think that's just one of those kind of pros and cons versus full-time. And freelancer is, it's easier to bring them in earlier when you're full-time because mm-hmm. they're there all mm-hmm. the time. Yep. Even if it's a remote situation, you're just always involved in the conversations. But for anyone who's listening who's kind of deciding between hiring an editor and like keeping freelancers if you end up keeping freelancers at least make sure you're bringing them into that project earlier because you're going to get better results and the editor is going to be happy and i will tell you from experience on both sides of it a happy editor is a happy producer so um always keep the editor happy and i say especially for stuff that like the editor has experience in like what you were just talking about like event recaps Mm -hmm. I mean, I've done, you know, so many, so like edited many and produced a few. It's just, you know, the kind of content that you want to get from like the man on the street interviews or whatever. So it's easier, you know, when you involve the editor to be like, what kind of things work when you watch the video as a final, like, you know, we want to get this sound bite. So let's form a question that, you know, gets that response. Well, you, like you said, you've been doing this particular type of video for a, a long time, or you've done a lot of them. <clears throat> uh, I bet there are things that you wish people would do differently, but you you know, oftentimes you're probably handed the same type of footage every single time. And so, you know, just contacting you, asking you, hey, is there anything you wanted to try differently or whatever ahead of time, gives us that opportunity. And I think it, I think it's important to to make those connections before you have a pile of footage. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, a lot of times these types of videos are just very formulaic and that's okay because it, it works. But I mean, it depends on the client. Like sometimes the client is like, you know, let's get creative and you know, Mm -hmm. what do you think we should do? And that's always, you know, a welcome treat. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, and we've made no secret on this podcast, our disdain for event (laughs) recap videos. Um, so, but I, you know, that that's knowing that you, um, have a lot of experience with them and like being able to craft those stories. That makes you the no-brainer for us makes to go to you as the event recap because a lot more. exactly right. Because even though even though we know that we're doing it because it's a, like a mandatory deliverable to get the the rest of the contract or whatever, we get to know that we get to hand it off to someone who likes doing that. Mm-hmm. And so you know we're willing to give those that creative flexibility to say, well, try something new with this because. And it's just better than, I mean, there's nothing worse than like going through a video project that you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. Right. And so no, <laughs> it always that, helps when you actually enjoy what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. And, but you know, again, I mean, as a, you know, as a producer hiring a freelancer, knowing the types of projects that you have experience in and like to do and, and, you know, knowing that you've got that energy about it, even if as a producer, I don't helps me feel better about it overall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I have a, so this isn't necessarily editing related, but I think, I think this insight could be interesting for our audience. Um, Red Hat's been they're If you look, I think they even have stuff online too about their studio. They, it's a healthy investment, right? Like they put a lot of money into not just space, but tools and human resources, people, uh, talent. They've been doing this for a long time. Like when, this is what, maybe 10 years ago you were working full time or? So I started at Red Hat in 2012. Okay. So they've, but they've had the team there even before you started, right? Like they were. So I started at Red Hat in 2012. And at that time the team was, 
maybe like four or five people. Um, and we were kind of just in the office with the rest of the company. Um, and to see the growth to where they are now, it's just, I mean, it's amazing. I just think I'm thinking back to a decade ago when video was a lot more expensive to produce. It was just kind of on that, that new wave of like digital, uh, with DSLR capabilities and stuff like that. But did you get the sense that Red Hat saw this as an investment or did they just understand this is a cost center, it's going to drain money, but we want it? What was the feeling behind it all? Were they just kind of gambling and trying, you know, seeing what ha- what works? Hmm. Let me think of a good way to start this. And you may, you may not have had that kind of like understanding. You were just there because you were excited to edit. <laughs> That's fine. I just... I'm thinking there's a lot of companies out there now who, you know, however big Red Hat was 10 years ago, um, they've grown to be one of the most respected software companies in the world. They just got purchased for $13 billion, something like that. Trump change. Yeah. Their CEO is the is now the president of IBM. I mean, like, they, they made some big moves <laughs> in the past 10 years. Definitely. I'm just wondering how much so, video really played a role or how they felt it, it played a role in their growth. In that department in Red Hat, um, it was amazing because all of the higher ups like really believe in creative, whether that's graphic design or animation or video. Um, and so I think that support really empowered everyone to like push. And I think that's how they've kind of grown and they, don't mind putting money into, you know, powerful storytelling. I mean, the open source stories short film series is like the great, a great example of that where it's not, it's not being made to generate revenue. It's being made because it's telling, you know, a gazillion different types of stories that embrace the open source philosophy. And so I think they see the value in, in sharing that story, even though it's not, really to promote Red Hat or to sell anything. Um, So I think like that type of support has been really great and is definitely not common in like larger organizations. Hmm. Especially when you're, when you're selling software and services, uh, like you need, you need an interface, you need graphics, you need something to to be able to approach software because otherwise it's just a bunch of code that someone's handing over to you or or I'm I'm sure I'm simplifying it beyond (laughs) Uh, but (laughs) but but that open source I mean the open source stories that to me is a brand connecting with its why Mm -hmm. right I mean it's there's there's a there's a a philosophy around open source as opposed Mm -hmm. to closed source right and so I think I, I think being able to identify that as their mission, you know, before they probably had any content teams, you know, that enables content teams to start from a root, you know, a core value, a why, and then, you know, whether it's revenue generating or storytelling, you know, or, uh, you know, marketing piece or sales piece. I mean, it, it all comes from that, that kind of core why, but I'm also really intrigued by that top down support. Mm -hmm. I think if you were to take, if anybody listening were at the point where they were maybe just starting to build their team, you know, if we look back now, then eight years to 2012, it sounds like that's when Red Hat was kind of building out that team. Mm -hmm. We know what they've become. I encourage anybody who's listening who doesn't know about a Red Hat or about the Red Hat video team in their studio, definitely look it up. We'll put it in the show notes. But I mean, that has grown to become, especially regionally, such a, like, talented team and a top-notch uh, corporate video team. So there was an eight-year journey there that I think a lot of people right now are probably at. They were very far ahead of the curve. But there are a lot of people out there right now in Red Hat's 2012 thinking, okay, let's build this team. And so, you know, it sounds to me like part of that is, is having that top-down support from from corporate leadership to say let's let's invest in sharing our story in in reaching people and in telling stories and uh in trying different things Mm -hmm. that buy-in is going to help you kind of build a foundation for building out your team Mm -hmm. um and if you've got that foundation then you know you've probably got 
some latitude to build your team differently, maybe. Um, all right. Well, should we dig into some of the, maybe some of the nitty gritties of what it takes or what makes a good editor? Yeah. Sure. You've been doing this for long enough that you've got sure some very strong feelings about what a good editor is and what a bad editor is or however you want to uh, qualify those. But like what, what makes a good editor in your opinion? I think a good editor is like a problem solver because I think anyone can watch like a lynda.com tutorial and like learn how to, you know, cut video together in Premiere. Um, but what makes the good editor is hearing what your client wants, what they need, what they're shooting for and helping them get there at the end of the video in a compelling way. Um, so I think if you're any, anyone can like learn how to cut a video, but you really need to tell a compelling story. So if you're taking, you know, a ton, you know, an hour long interview of in the weeds, technical speak, like how do you cut that in a way that you get everything important across, but you're not boring anybody, you know? So mm -hmm. I think it's about like finding, you know, the best bits and being able to tell that story in a compelling way. And that, that problem solving is, is true on a macro level from just making videos in general, you know, like, pre-production is all problem solving on the day of the shoot. It's all, there's <laughs> just problems left and right. Um, and if you can smoothly, you know, fix those problems or answer those questions and, and keep moving towards that goal, uh, that is, that is definitely an important part. Were you going to say something? Yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, I started as an editor, uh, 2009, 2010, while I don't do it as much anymore, um, I still feel like I am first and always an editor. And I completely agree with what Mars is saying. I mean, it is, it's about putting puzzle pieces together when you don't even really have the picture on the box. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of dump out with the raw mm -hmm. footage and the B-roll and, and, you know, interview audio and, I mean, whatever it is you're making. Um, and, and, you know, scripted content, right? Scripted live action content is probably more like, okay, well, at least you have the picture on the box. Yeah, yeah. But it's still taking all of these individual pieces and being able to look not just at which two pieces put together, but where do they fit together in the totality of what you're doing. So And also I mean, like I, knowing, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna say also making sure you understand the audience is super important because if I'm yeah. making, you know, a video about technology and the audience is someone that wants to learn about this technology, the video can be, you know, four minutes long. But if I'm making a video about technology that I want like a CTO to watch, it needs to be a minute and a half because they don't have time to be watching a four minute video. So, yeah. I mean, like knowing, knowing the audience is super important for when you're cutting. And I think also, I mean, being able to be kind of creative in the cut where, okay, maybe this video has to be a minute and a half, but there are, you know, are like five really great, you know, snippets that, and, you know, might've ended up on the cutting room floor, but like, mm -hmm. can we make this into like social content and kind of like mm -hmm. pitching those ideas? Because I mean, it's always a shame to lose like a gold nugget because you want the piece, you know, the end piece to be short. So, mm -hmm. you know, thinking of creative ways to help the client use all the content so they like really get their money's worth. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that reminds me of the manifesto, right? It's, it's video is a verb, not a noun. Mm -hmm. Even if you've been hired to just make one piece, mm -hmm. as the editor, you have the opportunity to say, hey, there's all this other stuff here that we can create out of this that makes this one video a campaign or, yeah, exactly. or whatever. Yeah, yeah and, I, and, I think, and I think that, I think that audience point is, is so key, too, because as an, as an editor, there's almost like a Google Earth approach. I mean, you have to be able to see it at the the 30,000 foot view. I mean, what do I need to accomplish in this 90 seconds? What do I need to say? Who am I saying it for? But then you also need to hit every level in between. You know, is it is there a three act structure you're trying to follow? So you're a little yeah. bit more detailed. Here's what I want to do in the first part. Here's what I want to do in the middle. Here's what mm -hmm. I want to do in the end. And then, of course, it get, then gets down to how does this cl clip match up with this clip? Where's my continuity? Am I cutting on action? I mean, all those kinds of things too. So you really have to bounce back and forth between the super detailed like one frame to one frame mm -hmm. to you know just looking at 90 seconds is one thing yeah you mentioned 
um, being, a, being a good problem solver and then a good storyteller. Where does that come from, the storytelling? How, do you, how can you tell if someone has that in them or not? What, what are things you could learn to be a better storyteller? I just feel like that's such a, that's such a I don't want it to be a throwaway term in, in this conversation because it's, it's used a lot all over the place and probably misused a lot too. So tell me what that means to you. Hmm. Let me think about that for just a second. That's a good question. Thank you. I'm trying to think of how to answer that because I don't want it to be like a throwaway either. Here, I'll throw something down. And if you okay. completely disagree, then, you know, maybe it'll give you something to disagree with. I, I think storytelling in, in the, you know, corporate commercial world is, I mean, yes, often a throwaway term. But to me, a story is something that has an identifiable beginning, a middle, and an end. Okay. And they work together with each other. So it doesn't just mean that, and then that doesn't mean that it follows a three act structure, but like there's, there's something that, that gets your attention or gives you context or starts you off on whatever message it is we're trying to tell over six seconds or six minutes, whatever mm -hmm. it is. And then there's a middle piece where we get to, you know, a lot of the meat of what we're trying to tell, whether it's somebody's story, a testimonial, uh, a product video, whatever. And then there's the end that often, you know, ends in a call to action. But in a lot of the best storytelling cases, also kind of we end knowing where the beginning was too. So it almost kind of creates this little loop where we close off. And so it has, you know, if you showed it to somebody once, they'd be able to basically remember it that this is where it started, this is where it went, and this is where it mm -hmm. ended. And I think when when you define storytelling as that, it really opens up. You know, you you aren't really stuck with this like hero's journey or yeah. a fairy tale kind of thing or whatever. And it's more like we're trying to clearly state certain things and do it in an organized way that fits with how our brain likes to kind of process mm -hmm. uh, information and retellings of things. Mm -hmm. That that to me is a story. I love the constraint of trying to tell a story in six seconds. Absolutely. I think it's, it's such a fun exercise. You know, even like, there, so where's the beginning, middle, and end in, in this? It's one clip, right? You start camera down, foot level, right? Some kid shoes, and there's just a glob of ice cream on the ground. And then you crane up, and you see a kid holding an empty ice cream cone. Uh -huh. There's a story there, right? And yeah. that, that, like, then you could cut to whatever, like, logo yep. <laughs> or something. There's a story there. You're not. There's no beginning, middle, and end, but you require the the viewer to create those, and you empower them to create the story in their own head. Yeah. Uh, although I would challenge that the beginning, middle, and end there is we start by seeing a children's shoes, and we all of a sudden know what setting we're in. Yeah. Right. And then you see the ice cream. And we're like, well, that's not where ice cream is supposed to be. Yeah. Right? I mean, you don't go through that level no, it of just thinking, happens but it's like, like that. it instantly happens. So you see a child's shoes, and we're like, oh, okay, that's a kid. We're, you know, at a park or something. Mm -hmm. I can tell that instantly in like two frames. And then I see ice cream in a place that's not supposed to be. Uh oh, something's wrong. Right. I'm already thinking about what it could probably be. And then as we build that like four second tension, to get to the empty cone, that's the payoff mm -hmm. to me. So to me, that is a beginning, setting, mm -hmm. middle, care, something's care off, development, right? Some <laughs> there's a tension, and then tension, there's this yeah, tension, ten tension, right? Yeah. And then there's this release with, you know, crying kid with an empty cone. Yeah. And maybe that's where I thought it would go, but that still went from, you know, mm -hmm. a kid's shoes to a crying kid mm -hmm. with an empty. So I, I don't know. I, th I think you can. That's to me, that's what's so interesting about six second pieces is you get to respect the human mind's ability mm -hmm. to process information very quickly. Trusting your viewers. We're so used to taking 30, 60, 90 seconds to do something, and yet we're so wired, especially visually, to understand and learn things about what we're seeing super fast. Mm -hmm. I also and also, like, good story. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. And I would also say, like, you know, there's an aspect to good storytelling which is about like leaving certain things out or, I mean, like you, yes, we don't yes. need to see the kid walk to the ice cream. 
yep. stand to buy the ice cream, to walk away, to have his first bite, to drop it. You know, you exactly. can start with the problem. And I think a lot of the stuff that I do, which is like, you know, customer reference pieces for people that have used technology or products that have been, that they've had a great success with. It usually starts with them being like, you know, before this, you know, A, B, and C, and it was really horrible. <laughs> so like, you know, you're starting with their problems. So you're like, oh, like, how is this going to get fixed? So you're already intrigued. You you know, you see the ice cream on the ground, you're already intrigued, you yeah. know, it's about like what's going to happen next. Um, so I think a lot of times like starting with, you've got to start with something that's going to draw them in. And a lot of times that's like the problem that they faced in their mm-hmm. organization or, you know, the ice cream already on the ground. Yeah. I can't remember where I heard this, but I love I love this concept and it's kind of what you were saying. It's, it's as important to leave things out as it is to put them in. Like comic books, you see one frame and you see some dialogue and then, and then you see the next frame. And the story takes place between those frames. You know? Mm-hmm. It's, it's what is not being shown that you know that Batman hopped in his car and he's on the way to save the day. Um, yeah. Maybe a little off track, but it's a well, fun no, conversation. But that's, I'm going to go further off track with it because <laughs> that's that's interesting because because there's a similar principle in drumming, right? Like what everybody mm-hmm. typically hears is is what happens on the beats, space right? Between and it's the space between mm-hmm. the beats that for a drummer, right? And and for a and musician, piano. it's the space yeah. between the beats where you're doing 99.9 percent of what you're doing. It's just that, yeah, right. That everybody hears, but it's all of everything that goes into that. And and again, as a drummer, where you need to be next, and how you flail your and arm, how to you hit get, it. and and how you know how yep. how hard do you need to hit? What are the dynamics? You know, and so there's m- the vast majority of what you're doing and thinking about is getting to the next thing, but all anybody actually hears is those four yeah. beats every yeah. measure. Which again, and I think I've talked about this before, but that is at least for me. One of the things that I think helped me become a good editor was my drumming background. Mm-hmm. Just having that rhythm <clears throat> and that that you know being able to Knowing kind of to create and a pace and so much of editing to me is like arranging a song, mm-hmm. right? It's and being taking, like being musical, like having musical yeah. ability or just like loving music and having rhythm is, I think, like I mean, you can be a good editor and like not have any rhythm, but yeah. I think it really helps because I mean, a lot of times, like all if I'm editing a piece together, like. I cannot start cutting together the story without some music underneath. I'm the um, same way. And that's like helps with pacing helps with like, you know, breathing room, um, you know, like where you want to hit, like the mm-hmm. big part of the story, like, you know, so mm-hmm. I think having musical ability, mu- some sort of musical talent is mm-hmm. like super helpful. Yeah. A lot of times, even when you don't use the audio, you'll edit like, I remember Anthony a couple of days ago is, had to edit something that didn't wasn't gonna have any sound. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it was our like the, reel or the, whatever. Yeah, the hero video for our new site. Yeah. Um, what new site? We like, got a new site coming. Uh, <laughs> and then, but yeah, he's like, I have to cut it to music. I'm like, that yeah. makes sense. It's smart. Yeah. Especially a reel. That's hard with no music. <laughs> I know. Well, it's, yeah. I mean that. Yeah. I mean this one was a 20 second loop. That's going to be kind of at the top of the just site. Visuals. Okay. Cool. But like, it's still like, yes, it's better following a rhythm than just being mm-hmm. an otherwise, you know, not random, but you know, an otherwise cut together Every collection. Even, even if you use the same clips, I don't know. It just works better following that music, even if you can't hear the music. Mm-hmm. It just helps give it some momentum to kind of like push it. For sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about um, different st- being experienced in different styles of videos? So, you know, like narrative pieces, scripted pieces, um, interview stuff, event stuff. Does having a, a broad um, base of experience help you as an editor, or do you prefer to kind of hone in on a specialty or two or three? I mean, I think if you have experience doing all those different types of stories, then if you're a freelancer, it's just going to help you get more work, which is great. Um, And it's also nice because, I mean, if I'm just doing customer success story after customer success story, like it's going to get so stale and maybe, you know, my fifth one of the month is just not going to sing because I've done Mm -hmm. four already. So it's just nice to be able to kind of break it up. And when you're freelance, that's what's kind of, really great because you're either, you know, you're doing 
a customer success story, you're doing an event recap for someone else, you're doing, you know, like, you know, slow-mo like product video for another company, you're doing like a jeans ad, you know? So I think like being able to do all different types of things is what sort of keeps everything exciting. And then when I go back to do a customer success story, which is kind of like what I do a lot, then I'm like, okay, like I've done, you know, four other things and now I can mm-hmm. be excited again about this type of mm-hmm. video. Yeah. Right. Speaking of jeans ad, I think it's time that we uh, break for our sponsors. Pop in with spot. Okay, we'll do a quick little <laughs> sponsor break here. All right, so let's hear from our new sponsor, Steep. Have you seen uh, season four of Rick and Morty? I have not. Anthony, did you finish the Last Dance documentary? Marge, did you see the last episode of Westworld? I'm not caught up on Westworld. Of course not. How can you? You can't possibly watch it all. In the age of infinite media, there's always too much to consume, too little time to do it, and the consequences are staggering. Imagine, on your next virtual happy hour, a book club, or FaceTime with friends, and you have to sit this one out because you don't know how the last dance ended. The Bulls won. Oh, okay, good. Uh, Spoiler alert. Now you don't have to. The answer to all of your media consumption and adequacies are finally here. Introducing Steep. Steep helps you watch it all without even opening an eye. Visit steepwhileyousleep.com for details. Mm. Now, Mars, I understand you've been using Steep for uh, uh, the last week. How's that? Um, yeah. <laughs> tell me like a little bit about the experience. A lot of weird dreams. <laughs> yeah. Are they I, like, dreams? Wake, I just wake up feeling exhausted because there's just <laughs> so much going on in my my head while I'm sleeping now. Which yeah, I yeah man. Yeah no I I um uh I used it three weeks ago, um and I haven't been able to sleep on a Tuesday night since, <laughs> but I'm not using it anymore. Uh-huh. Like it like eternal sunshine on the spotless mind or whatever it like uh-huh. it messed up my head yeah <laughs> and i don't know i feel a little bit like a guinea pig because um they the don't FDA seem is not approved they don't seem to have a website we just took them on as a sponsor because they brought us a briefcase full of money and they said put on these these vr headsets right but then you've got to actually like plug it into your ear mm-hmm. and um yeah i don't know i haven't been quite the same since but you know it is interesting um, it is interesting to know how Westworld not only ends, but I've seen a, a sneak peek of a yet unfilmed, I don't know how they do it, uh, season four. During your sleep? Yeah. And I don't know if I dreamt it and now they're co-opting it as like the basis of a season, but whew. No wow. spoilers. Yeah. No spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> no. So I, they're actually showing you things that don't even exist yet. Or <laughs> they've implanted the first three seasons in me and I'm extrapolating and out the next and then they own it. Fascinating. And now HBO gets to produce my ideas. I don't even know oh anymore. Oh my gosh. In fact, they're I don't know. They're just stealing your intellectual property before you've even spoken exactly. it into existence. Exactly. Which I understand why they've raised so much money. I don't think it's part of their public pitch, but just like all of the big internet companies, they're stealing data. my data. It's just dream data. Mm-hmm. Which no one has tapped dream into data. yet. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Until now. Exactly. <laughs> wow. So, we are thrilled to have Steve yes, as a sponsor. Um, us this week. Steve. I'm pretty sure if I said anything bad about them, uh, I wouldn't wake up one morning. <laughs> so, um, all hail Steve. <laughs> Did I just say that out loud? I don't know. I was nodding off. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, so grateful to have Steep as a sponsor. Let's get back into our conversation with Mars Kennedy, uh, editor extraordinaire, mm-hmm. both <laughs> freelance and full time. We've had a lovely discussion thus far. Where should we take the discussion now? Well, I I'm kind of curious. Like we meant, you mentioned two things that were most important problem solving and storytelling um what can you say about like the kinds of hardware software capabilities like training are there things that they need to have and think like like actual physical things like a, a certain type of graphics card or 
or because there's a lot of people on this who have no idea what a graphics card is. You know, what are some of the things that we need to have, whether it's training, uh, those, some of those soft skills, or the hardware uh, requirements to be a decent editor? I think if you are in the freelance world, you need to be completely set up to work from home on your own equipment. Um, so, I mean, like, I, I work on a laptop, um, and mine is, like, a MacBook Pro. It's, like, the most tricked out one you can get when I bought it like a year and a half ago. So I probably need to upgrade soon. Um, but I mean, it's a beast. So, I mean, it can handle pretty much anything until we get to about eight (laughs) K and then it starts Mm -hmm. like kind of struggling. Um, but I think like as a lot of motion graphics, are you? No, no, I'm like strictly video. Like I do like, I can do like simple type animation titles. Um, but I'm not doing any animation, just video. Okay. I think that's a good point too because it you could use a motion graphics uh, or anima- designer or animator for basic titles and and I don't even want to say basic but like you know text treatments on mm-hmm. video but I think part of what makes a good editor is someone who's got enough of that eye for kind of that like graphic eye to know that they can put in their own titles whether it be a lower third or a section title or a piece title or whatever mm-hmm. Where maintaining the brand guidelines and using the right, you know, typeface and, and all that kind of stuff can do it yourself, can do it themselves. I think you're much more marketable as an editor when you've got yeah. those those skills that you can add on to the actual video editing so that they don't have to pass it off to, mm-hmm. you know, a motion graphics person or yeah. a second editor or something. I would say definitely. And that's like one of the things that I'm I'm always asking for as an editor if I'm if someone's a client's reaching out to me is if they do need titles Then I need like the brand guidelines. Like, can they send me a zip of the font? So I know exactly what, what I'm, what I'm supposed to be using, like what weights, like everything so that I know Mm -hmm. their brand guidelines. So if I'm putting in titles that they match, you know, what they need. (laughs) Um, I feel like it's going to happen soon. If not already happening a little bit, but brand guidelines are, have, traditionally in all like every single one that i see are for print print and web print and web yeah there is nothing that has to do with motion you're talking about a single frame this frame this sheet that i'm holding or uh this letterhead or whatever it is have you seen any companies hand you video branding guidelines because i mean there's a lot of a lot of things you can mess up just based on the, the the print and web, or maybe not even mess up, but just if it's not defined, then there's just inconsistency across right. video content. Like movement, what kind of movement is it? Sharp angles or rounded, you yeah. know, rounded movement, or you know, can you do a, a a wipe here, or is it have to be hard cuts, like stuff right. like that? Th- those things don't really exist for a lot of companies. We've done them for a couple yeah. clients, but yeah, I mean, we yeah, I was gonna say we've done a couple, but yeah. outside of that, I, I've never seen one handed to we've us. We've never had a client hand one to us. Yeah, I think so. a lot of a lot of times, um, I mean, I've worked with clients that are you know pretty big, and they, I'm like, what typeface do you guys use, and for like what should, what typeface should I be using for this title? And they're like, oh, I don't know, like whatever you think looks good, and I'm like, Comic Sans okay. or Papyrus. <laughs> Yeah. Oh God, papyrus. <laughs> I always go with papyrus. You know, if I don't know, it's like my default. Well, it's or a good place. To, it's a good place to start because there's only up to go for papyrus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. You just throw um, the papyrus in there for the first cut so that the client feels like they have something to comment on. Yeah. Right. Exactly. right. <laughs> there you go. That one. <laughs> and then if they say, "Ooh, I like that font," you never work with them again. You're like, <laughs> "Oh no." Um, yeah. Um, I'd, I'd say it's like it's very rare that I get like um these are our video branding guidelines. Like Red Hat obviously has like a really well thought out and extensive like guideline where they have, you know, screenshots of, you know, the talking head with the lower third. So you know Mm -hmm. how big to make it, you know, the X and the Y axis, the weights of the font, you know, the -hmm. secondary Mm -hmm. font, the colors, like, you know, we're always using this shade of gray, not this shade of gray kind of thing. Um, So that's always really nice when you get that, but it's not, it's just like not always the case. So you kind of just, use your best judgment or watch, you know, some of the videos Mm -hmm. that they've put up in the past. And then kind of, if you think that what they've done in the past is like kind of dated or not successful, like you can always suggest. And I think that's, that's also what makes a good editor because you, a lot of times, like I'm working with people that just 
don't understand anything about video and that's Mm -hmm. okay. So it's my job to kind of educate, guide, help them understand, like show them what might work better for them moving forward. And then, you know, they'll hopefully, you know, kind of get it as we go. But a lot of times, you know, I'm working with people that just, they just don't know and that's fine. But so it's my job to kind of help them understand either this is the way we want to tell this story because A, B, and C. And, you know, we shouldn't open with someone saying their name and title because we can cover that in a lower third, you know, kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Yep. What are some of the, like, when you went to, maybe this is, but when you went to work at Red Hat, they probably had, like most employees, they get a spot to sit. And they have a computer and some pens and a little welcome package or whatever. Great. But like editing is a different beast. It's not all like, what, what do you They got very work? specific. <laughs> oh, that's what companies do these days. You haven't been hired anywhere in a long time. No, I haven't. <laughs> but they give you they give you swag and stuff. No. But like, <laughs> Are we supposed to be doing that? Uh, we could start. Okay. Um, we get you yeah, some where's my storyboard today. media swag? <laughs> um, we will send you some. Yeah, we'll send you uh, <laughs> some pens, apparently. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, we have a bunch of mouse pads, actually, that no one's ever asked for. Uh, <laughs> it's just Justin's face. <laughs> but so if if you're a company who is hiring an editor as your first video hire or whatever, second, whatever, what are some of the things as a company you need to provide that editor? If you're hiring them full time? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know if it's really my place to say, <laughs> but well, what would you I mean, want I think, if you were if you were yeah, going to work? Yeah, what at, would you want? I think is is a way that I mean, you could answer I would that. want I would want a computer that is like top of the line, can like edit anything with no problem, like eight K, can do animation if I need to do animation, is not going to get like tripped up when I'm trying to, you know, compress something so, or. So basically, you mean a lot of RAM, right? A lot of RAM, yeah. a good GPU, a good graphics a card. RAM. Mm-hmm. And um, hard drives or the hard drives you should be like, are those helpful? Yeah, I would, yeah, I would. I mean, just like whatever. I mean, it just needs to be like the best video editing computer that they can provide, and then also like an ergonomic chair, <laughs> like a keyboard tray. Like you know, it's you want to. I mean, if you're going to be sitting in that space for several hours a day, like it's super important to be very comfortable so you can take care mm-hmm. of your body and like I mean when I'm just yeah, working you, on my laptop on a kitchen a table exactly so I mean <clears throat> exactly. I imagine so it's, I, I imagine you're not getting a dedicated edit bay so headphones yeah I was gonna say I think would be something I would that, want that I would headphones. want yeah if I was out in an open workspace or a cubicle I think, or whatever I think two monitors is a, almost a must. Oh yeah. Two so monitors, like a, a desk big enough for two monitors and a, some decent speakers. Um, yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. And maybe not right by a window. So you don't have a lot of glare. Yep. Um, yeah. now I'm trying to think of like weird specifics. Yeah. That's what I want. Yeah. That's what we want. <laughs> but yeah, but, but it's like when you say Ram, like how much Ram do you think they should have in a computer? Mm, I don't know. I, I don't think I'm good at answering these questions. Okay. <laughs> Let's cut that. Just I'm like I'm not like um, super like computer. Or, yeah, I'm not yeah. a computer. I'm not a gearhead. But like, just give me a computer that can edit some video sure. quickly. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, there's there's, you know, Google it. Uh, you know, I mean, there's <laughs> you'll be able to find the minimum like top line specs. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I remember and when this, I started. Like, I was going to say, there's this new Mac that's like $40,000 and it is like insanely fast. My mind was blown. They were like, hey, you should like work on this computer. And I was like, okay. And I was trying to, um, oh my God, what was I? I was transcoding. um, What was I doing? Gosh, I was like transcoding like 80 clips that were all like huge. And it did Mm -hmm. it in like 30 seconds. Oh my gosh. Well, see that. Amazing. Yeah. Where it would have I taken mean, like a normal, really good computer, it would have taken that computer like <clears throat> two hours. You know, like it was insane. I mean, I remember enough from I don't know, maybe eight years ago. The last time I kind of geeked out on on tech specs. Mm-hmm. It's you know a lot of that stuff has to do with uh, how many cores you have in your processor. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. like 
my MacBook Pro is a quad core processor, but I think literally, I think that new Mac Pro 16? has like a 32 core Jeez. processor, 24 <sighs> core oh processor. God. So, but Im- imagine, so that's that's like, you know. I mean, you can have 24 eight. chips of RAM in there, right? Yes. Yeah. A- and, and, and so that's like eight um, computers. <laughs> Yeah, right. Jesus. Eight to ten computers, depending working on what together. you work with, working together from a CPU standpoint, and then the the RAM that's available on those is, so it it can just build up this RAM instead of having to like max out the RAM, put it on the drive, empty out the RAM. It just fills up, and and so the combination of those two things just makes that kind mm-hmm. of like transcoding just <clears throat> super fast. I didn't Damn. know it was that fast, but it's like it's um, it's it's wild. I was just like, oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, it was insane. <clears throat> I might be I remember, kind of, um, I might be a little bit hyperbolic in my explanation, but it was like yeah. maybe one minute for, I don't yeah. know. I'm but trying to think is, of the gig. I mean, it is interesting because because I just went in I mean, that's like just, that's a time thing. You're just saving. Yes. The, the more well, that's that, the kind of you thing you would do over out. a weekend. Right. Right. Exactly. And and it's more it's more compressed six uh, K footage. Yeah. 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 And also like it's more obviously like that type of computer like I'll never need a computer that powerful but like for an animator I mean when you're like trying to export out like a 30 second video to review it and you can export it in five minutes instead of you know 17 hours it's just like I mean it it, it makes more sense for an animator but still our animators bill us for rendering time oh yeah I mean it's just like you're babysitting it's just like I mean I, I I, I would almost rather invest in a better machine for them so for, <laughs> to for offset our, the rendering yeah, time. Right? That for our listeners uh, who are businesses out there, when I was just just starting uh, Just a wee like, babe? Yeah, like in the full-time video stuff, I was still I was working for full-time for a company. Remember, the uh, Ben and I actually worked, that's where we met. We were working on a bunch of training content for their, every year they'd hire 600 interns from all over the country bring him to Chapel Hill, and Ben and I would create content, video content that would help assist in the training programs mm-hmm. that, that they had created for the students. Well, on the opening day, oh God. Th- there are opening <laughs> ceremonies, right? And there are, uh, uh, the one video that we always, we always invested a lot of time and money in that had no actual value beyond that day. One time the, play, a what, one time play. <clears throat> was the, the regional manager introduction video. So this is before, be, like all of these 600 interns, they each of them knows one of them because they got hired by that one person. But there are like 18 different regional managers. And so they want to bring them out on stage and introduce them, but they want to hype up the audience. So so Ben and I created uh, like a hype video for the, for the managers and we kind of had to say, you know, like Arlene, Ball State University, uh, Shenandoah Valley region mm-hmm. and like that kind of stuff, but you had to do it f- in a fun way. Um, so mine was with, uh, you know, green screen footage. And so I, all the backgrounds were composed and changed and, and different. And I was on this old Mac that I, that was my personal Mac, not the company's had all, had like eight gigs of Ram, I think. And this thing was about six minutes long, the video. Yeah. I was rendering I had it in my lap in the passenger seat on the way to the opening ceremony. On the way to the opening ceremony. It was still rendering before this live event. <laughs> and we didn't even know if it, after it was done rendering if it would play. Yeah. We all like we had one chance to to hit play and make sure that it actually played. I don't even think we watched it all the way through. We're like, okay, it ends, it begins. It's probably fine. There's probably a middle. And just yeah. imagine if the, if I didn't if I had either not hit export soon enough. Or if I if I didn't have a powerful enough machine, there would have been 600 kids out, out there thinking like this company looks absolutely stupid. And then yeah, like, I have witnessed I have witnessed someone in that exact position before, like a several thousand person conference trying to export yeah. an opening video, and that's just not a position you ever want to be in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So get yeah get some good machines. Peter still asked me about that. <laughs> <laughs> well. Mars, let's say you're uh, working for Red Hat, and still, let's say you're still there, and they're hiring another editor. What are some of the questions you would ask the interviewee, the person you're trying to hire, to tell to see if they're uh, if they're any good? Ooh, I don't know. 
I think if I had thought about it beforehand, I might be able to answer, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I kind of threw that one in here about two minutes before we called you. <laughs> I don't know that I'd ask any technical questions. Yeah. I wouldn't <clears throat> ask technical questions. What do you I mean think by technical? I would, say, say t- like, give me a technical like, question. Like, do you know how to use Premiere? You know, like, I wouldn't ask, like, stuff like that. But I don't know what, I don't, I don't know. I'm not an interviewer. I've never had to interview someone for a job. So I think uh, I've never really thought about, I've never thought about that. What I think questions? I would want to know editing platform of preference. Mm-hmm. But to me, there's still no right or wrong answer for that. Sure, sure. I mean, I, for a long time, I was a big Final Cut Pro 10 evangelist, uh, Apple certified, etc. But I haven't touched final cut in almost three years and then and so because we use premiere i've just gotten used to it Mm -hmm. um and and now to be perfectly honest if i have to you know put together a quick sample something or whatever i go into premiere because i just know it better they all do wonderful things and they all do the same thing they just do it different ways right basically so uh, you know i would say yeah i'd be interested and i say over here it's sorry go ahead ahead. This is my podcast. (laughs) Um, And I think, you know, around these parts, like Premiere is pretty much the standard. Like if you're in LA or New York, it's Avid, but I think most everyone is using Premiere. It feels like a showbiz thing more than than anything. But again, to me, from my perspective, whether I were you know, leading an in-house team or, or building an in-house team or in my current position, I don't really, I don't really care what you use as long as you're comfortable in it and you yeah. can get it done. Right. Yeah. I mean, you'd, you'd want to know that they're proficient in enough to, yes. to produce, like you'd have to watch the reel. Yeah. And if exactly. you're like, here's one thing that we've always, so people have reels all over the place. Great. What did you do? in that like what was the what was the mission and what did you do did you color that if you didn't i don't like don't let me assume it right you did color it did you do the graphic treatments no okay then why are those in here or what are you showing me why like what's the context for this footage um i also don't really if i'm if i'm looking for an editor i don't love just watching reels that'll get them to like all right i'll look more yeah after watching a reel but I want to know how they how they told a story, and if they have those chops, understanding those beats and everything. If they've got a good rhythm, if they've kept me engaged through those, you know, seventy two seconds or whatever it is. Um, I want to see actual finished produced pieces, and I want to know exactly what they did. Yeah, That's, I think it's it's more difficult with a reel when you have. Uh, when you do so many roles, because then like maybe someone else did mm-hmm. color it or someone else directed mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Like for me, I'm just like I'm an editor. Here's my editing reel. This is how I would cut together this reel. And then I'm on my you know my portfolio website. It has like you know all the pieces that I've worked on. And then it says you know I edited, I colored, or I edited, I did not color this. You know like mm-hmm. it says the specifics. So the person watching. I think you're far ahead of the average freelance editor by sharing that much information. We so rarely see that level of information, mm-hmm. and it's frustrating. When I just don't want to mis- I don't want to misrepresent myself, and then have them think I can do something that I can't. Mm-hmm. Or you know, I yep. want it to be like, I don't know, I don't know. Like I just want it to be as like as transparent as possible. But I think if you're bringing someone in for an interview, you've seen their work, you like their work enough to talk to them. The most important thing is that you like them. I mean, you have mm-hmm. to get along with them, um, and you want to work with them. So mm-hmm. I think those, uh, what, whatever questions that, I mean, or just like hanging out, I mean, like a lot, say again? Well, yeah, whatever questions you would ask any interviewee to, to, if you were going to work with them, I think there are those like personal, you know, preferences of, is this person, am I going to get along with them and enjoy working with them? That's definitely. Yeah. Exactly. I mean. It, it shouldn't be that different. Uh, and you just got to be able to like their work. Well, yeah. and, I, and, and if you're going to be spending, if you're going to be spending all that time with them, it's you know, it's important that you want to be around them and you enjoy working with them because if you don't, then you're just going to be <laughs> in hell. <laughs> I I like to try to figure out, and and sometimes people aren't always completely honest, but I like to figure out if they're going to want to do the work that we need them to do. Yeah, because mm-hmm. there there's a lot of you know we've <clears throat> talked about different styles, but like. You know, if somebody really doesn't like 
doc work and 90% of the work we did for our clients was like customer success stories and things like Mm -hmm. that. That's kind of a doc style approach. They may be a very qualified editor and they may really want to work in our office and we might really like them as a person, Mm -hmm. but if they're not going to be happy and they're not going to feel like they're doing the kind of work that they like to do, then one, I don't think I'm probably going to get their best work out of them. Mm -hmm. And two, they're probably not going to be happy very long and, you know, going to look to go somewhere else. So, It's hard to, you know, I I think you have to start, you know, I think that's part of the interview process is you gauge how trustworthy this person is. And then you have to ask them that question. And you can kind of tell toward the end of an interview if if if, if they really want to do that kind of stuff. I think that's hugely important when it's a hiring decision. I could hire a perfectly qualified, you know, good editor to do some customer success stories if it's one project. Mm -hmm. But it, if if they're not like really psyched about doing the kind of work that we do, mm-hmm. I don't know. That's a big red flag to me. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you are an employer hiring an editor, hopefully you know the types of videos you're going to be doing. Is there a lot of green screen studio work, right. or is this on location? Yeah, you know stuff like that. I think um, Mars. How do you feel about that as a freelancer? Do you, you know, being the interviewee, do you um, do you feel like you're able to be honest about the type of stuff you like to do, or are you kind of wary about like, eh, you know, I can do this for this one project, but I'm glad I don't have to do this over and over again. Do you ever come across that kind of feeling? I would say there aren't many types of projects that like I hate and like won't work on. Um, I'm like pretty flexible and. Like I said before, like I enjoy working on all different types of stuff. So I think, um, like I get, like if you hate working on customer success stories, like then maybe you shouldn't, or maybe take one every once in a while when you like, you know, really need the work, I guess. But, um, I'm not one to turn down work because I really enjoy all the different types of projects out there and like getting to know those clients and then like building that relationship is super important so that you get to that point where you're comfortable enough to be like, you know, I really don't like working on customer success stories. Like, do you guys have any event recaps or, you know, like I would love to work on something like that. So I think building that relationship, like saying yes so that you can build that relationship is important in, I'd say in the freelance world. I think that's huge in the, in the freelancer relationship there because it's so easy as, as, as a client, whether you're a producer or, or a company, um, to kind of pigeonhole editors into certain stuff, mm-hmm. you know, and you, if you're working with multiple editors, oh, you know, Mars is our event recap person and, you know, Anthony's our podcast person. Mm-hmm. And it's so easy to just pigeonhole if the editor isn't sharing, you know, hey, I'd like to do, you know, do you guys have anything like this? Because I've really been wanting to do this or I just did, you know, had a really good time working on this kind of project. I'd love to do more of this. If the editor isn't, communicating that to us it's hard for us to know and so we Mm -hmm. just keep pigeonholing them so i think that's i think that's a a necessary part of the freelancer relationship is the freelancer being able to say hey i want to try something like this or that or whatever and if you are like if you are in that full-time employment situation and you you uh, yeah maybe you do 50 percent of your work are those doc style customer success stories well maybe the editor can find a way to make that exciting for them, right? Yeah. Do something, make this unlike any other customer success story. Use that as a, as like a motivator or, or like a you know, uh, uh, sort of a catalyst for ma- doing this a different way. Might be a way to, to kind of handle a situation because mm-hmm. you know we we don't all love everything we do about our jobs. There's stuff that you just you have to kind of you have to do and you have to do it well even if you don't like doing all of it, but sometimes you can find a way to, to make it more fun. Yeah, definitely. By like creating opportunities for yourself and that's more, you know, feasible at a full time type of, yeah, you know, company. So I've always viewed the role of editor as kind of the last writer. Um, I mean, that's almost like the textbook definition of an editor, right? Like you hand off, in a writing piece, a writer oh, hands off yeah, 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 like a book, right, editor, a yeah. book to an editor, and then the editor makes you know the last changes or whatever. But I've also viewed the the role of editor as like the one who gets the last say on, you know, 
when when it's not a situation that there's a you know director strongly involved in post production, the editor gets to say, "Here's how I think this fits together together better," mm -hmm. especially when it's something scripted. And this comes from uh, my kind of first realization of this was um, that same project you were talking about with hiring the interns, right? Where we were rendering out the uh, the um, the video right before the live event, and we had God knows how many scripts that we had kind of given to a committee to get approved. Mm -hmm. And there were just some fundamental creative differences between you and I and some of the executives mm -hmm. at the company. We felt like they were, generally speaking, it was, we felt like they weren't speaking to their audience the right way. Or mm -hmm. like, the, you know, they were referring to something as a mobile app when like, it should just be like the app, right? Yeah. So any like little things like that to then bigger stuff and and I remember almost like a mutiny as we were going through and doing final cuts on these things we would cut out the lines so like we would say we don't need this line or this paragraph in the script review the executives would say no let's leave that in and then we would get to editing after having shot everything and we would cut it out and nobody noticed. <laughs> and so it ended up being a better piece because the editor was able to go in and say, And make you know, the right and, choice for the audience. Exactly, and like, yeah. exactly. And so, I mean, that was kind of my first exposure to it. But I think it kind of ties a, a bow on this whole conversation because we talked earlier about how early you want to be brought in <clears throat> to the process. And I think, I think the earlier you're brought in, Mar Marge, you were saying that especially working full time on a team like that, everybody's kind of involved from the beginning. If you're involved from the beginning, you get to influence the project all along, but then you still get to be that last person who kind of puts their final, has the opportunity to put their final stamp on mm -hmm. this is what that should be. Marge, have you ever had situations like that where you feel like despite maybe what was agreed to before you did an alternate cut of something or you tried something that you felt strongly about because it made it different and you leveraged the power that comes with being the <laughs> editor to do that have you ever come across that or are we just crazy no i do that all the time um good uh i would say like a lot of times i'll get like paper edits from clients where it's like the transcript and then highlighted, you know, like we love this snippet, this snippet, this snippet in this order. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times the client is looking at it from a perspective of like, these are points that I think are important. We should have all of this in the video. And then when you're editing, when I'm editing the video, it's like, wow, this is super repetitive or like this doesn't make any sense here. So typically if I'm doing work for a client and they've sent me a paper edit, I will do the paper edit exactly how they wanted it. Mm -hmm. And then I will do an alt where I'm like, this is my recommendation mm -hmm. for you. Um, so I will almost always do an alt cut um, with my recommendations. And I mean, typically they go with the alt, which is great yeah. because, you know, reading from a transcript and seeing on a video is like completely different. Um, but yeah, I'd say like a lot of times, you know, the client will have something in their mind that they really want. And then I'm helping them. I'm I, I, a good editor is like an interpreter. You are trying to interpret their vision in like a compelling and concise way that makes sense for the audience and for the video as a whole. So whether you're interpreting like the director's vision or maybe the client that doesn't know a lot about video, like you're kind of helping them understand like this is the way that it should be done because A, B, and C. Um, so you're kind of, helping guide what happens in the end. I don't think it's about kind of having the last word, but kind of coming to an understanding and agreement of like what is best for the video. So mm -hmm. I would say like, I, I mean, I think like you have to be flexible and you, you have to be able to push back a little bit, but of course it's like the client's decision. So you kind of are just kind of helping them, helping them, helping guide them in the right direction. I totally agree. I don't know if you've read our manifesto, but the first point is that every video needs to have a, pur a clearly defined purpose. And as long as you're not losing track of what that purpose is, you can make those types of changes in the edit room and, and get to that purpose either faster or better 
Um, but it, but it, when people get this like ego trip about it has to be this line this way with these cuts, you may end up with a really shitty video. And that happens. I mean, that happens a lot. And then yeah. you kind of, you know, when you get to that point, you kind of say to yourself like, okay, like I'm not going to put this on my portfolio and that's okay. Like they, yeah. you know, they want it this way and they have hired me to do this. And yep. You know, it's not, I mean, that happens all the time. So, you, you know, you pick your battles, you kind of push back where you feel like you need to push back and step back when there's, you know, no point in continuing to push back. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mars, we're going to put some of your information in the show notes, assuming that's okay. Um, sure. But, Just but, like home address. <laughs> <laughs> show us the security <clears throat> number. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, where can people find out more about what you do? Um, do you have a podcast or, or, you know, this is your 30 second spot Mars. So my video editing reel is on vimeo.com slash Mars 42. And you can also view a lot of my other work there as well. Great. And we'll make sure to put that in the show notes as well. Cool. Yeah. So are you for hire Mars? I am. I'm so <laughs> bored. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. I'm hoping I'm, I'm getting like, um, a project coming up, but I like wrapped up a f- bunch of stuff like a few weeks ago and it's just been, I mean, I've like kept in touch with people, but it's just been so dead. Everyone's, everyone's shoots are getting canceled. So there's just no footage to edit. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Mars. It's a pleasure yeah. as always. Thanks so much. Thanks for having um, me. Yeah. We, uh, hope to see you. hope to see you all again one day in person. <laughs> I'm sure we will. Um, this can't go on forever. <laughs> Yeah. Once we're all vaccinated, we'll be shaking hands, hugging, doing yes. shoots. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Um, Take us home, Ben. Yeah. Let's. Uh, yeah. So thanks everybody for listening or watching. If you're watching on the YouTube, um, as usual, the old like, subscribe, rate. Um, I can't believe we still do that. Uh, everybody I, does. I, you you kind of have to. I don't know. Like, it doesn't comment, seem to subscribe. Work. Like, comment, mm-hmm. subscribe. Yep. All the ratings, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, what's our normal outro? I forgot, but we do have a... <clears throat> just another, oh, yeah, we revisit we, the we sponsor. We for That's two right. ads, so... Yeah. Um, hey, have you seen season four of Rick and Morty? I have not. Is it Marty or Morty? Morty. <laughs> Morty. Did you finish the last dance documentary, Anthony? He did not. Hey, Mars... Did you see the last episode of Westworld? I am not caught up on Westworld. Nope. Of course not. You can't possibly watch it all. In the age of infant media, inf- <laughs> infant media. <laughs> okay. That's kind of where we are, though. Yes. We are media in for infant infants. In the age, yes. Welcome, ooh, storyboard media. Infantile media. That's our new name. Infantile media. Um, I like storyboard not. media, infantile media. <laughs> yeah, didn't know where I was going with that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually me doing that. Uh, of course not. You can't possibly watch it all. In the age of infinite media, there's always too much to consume, too little time to do it, and the consequences are staggering. Imagine, on your next virtual happy hour, a book club, or FaceTime with friends, and you have to sit this one out because you don't know what happened uh, in the last dance how it ended because you don't know Wait, how did it end and you and you have to sit this one out because you don't know how the last dance ended the bulls won Oop, spoiler alert uh now you don't have to the answer to all your media con- now you don't have to <laughs> the answer to all your media consumption inadequacies is finally here introducing steep steep helps you watch it all without even opening an eye steep while you sleep.com for details Visit sleep, visit steep while you sleep, <laughs> visit steep while you sleep.com for details. All right. Um, <laughs> hope to have steep while you sleep.com back as a sponsor next episode, but I just have a sneaking suspicion I'll be brain dead by then. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, thanks again for joining us. We will uh, see you or you will hear us next time on the Video Reformation Podcast. Yay. 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 How, many, how many podcasts is that? This is our 28th episode. Okay. And I believe episode 30 is supposed to be our year in review. Like our one year celebration of podcasts. Oh, so okay. I think we have one more episode to do and then 
we're supposed to. I mean, it's a suggested topic. Okay. You know, it could be a clip show or something. Mm. A bonus episode. All right. What are we, how many are we gonna do? Uh, until they start producing some leads, <laughs> and then we'll stop. <laughs> I don't know how many are going to do this. I think.